Well, it's the top of the hour, so we'll get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's LomCon seminar talk. I'm Dio Wagasback in Houston, and today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Amber Peritore Sanchez join us. Her talk is titled The Essentials of Therapeutic Plasma Exchange, Rationale, Prescription, and Avoiding Complications. Just a little background today, you know, we'll talk about the terminology, the background of apheresis, the rationale, and then we'll go in the details of prescription for plasma exchange. Um, so sorry, I got a typo on that one. Um, importance of the prescription, like how to prescribe the frequency, what fluids to use, et cetera, and the complications. And finally, I'll le le end this, this presentation talking about you know, how sometimes our patients need multiple extracorporeal procedures. And I just give you some pictures of the history of apheresis. You know, removing something bad from the blood is something that dates back even to the 1600s, 1800s. We can see in art that um, the notion of getting something toxic out of the blood has been a part of medical science for a long time. So why am I talking today at GlomCon about plasma exchange? Well, you know, at, at, we're not going to talk today about the specific indications for plasma exchange, but you can see if you compare the ASFA guidelines from 2023 and KDGO that there are many glomerular diseases where plasma exchange can be a, a part of the initial therapy. Um, we all know like anti-GBM and then the current controversies in ANCA vasculitis. Um, but also recurrent FSTS can sometimes use cryoglobulinemia, percentic IgN, severe cases of lupus and things like catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome and other TMAs like atypical HUS is also sometimes we're going to be adding plasma exchange. You know, when we think about plasma phoresis, you may not realize it, but it's actually something that was first described 111 years ago. And there were two simultaneous papers that came out in 1914. Um, one uh, that was at Johns Hopkins, uh, and that is uh, Abel and Roundtree that wrote this paper. And then at the same year, there was a paper out of Russia describing the same thing. And the method they described was manual plasma exchange, and it was in animals. Uh, but that's where that term was first coined. I realize we have a global audience today, but I just want to give you a little background of the landscape of apheresis in the U.S. You know, in private practice here in the U.S., most plasma exchange is supervised by a nephrologist. And then some of the other apheresis procedures like photophoresis, red cell exchange, cytophoresis, it may be done by nephrology, but it might be done by transfusion medicine, hematology, even other specialties. And at some institutions, it's a combination of all of these folks. And it's, and it's the apheresis nurses that take orders from different teams. Um, in most academic U.S. centers, the transfusion medicine service is who uh, runs a lot of the apheresis. And so it's a little unusual at UCSD that nephrology does all of it, including stem cell collections, et cetera. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of academic centers where it's shared by the different services as well. And in our country, knowledge of how to prescribe and supervise a therapeutic apheresis procedure is actually a requirement of gradual graduate medical education for nephrology, hemonc fellows, and pathology trainees. And so depending on where you're trained, your exposure to apheresis can be very different. And then you may take your first job and, um, and suddenly be responsible for the plasma phoresis and never had much prior exposure to it. And, and I think because this specialty is owned or this procedure is owned by many different specialties, that's actually a challenge for the education of it and also a challenge in moving forward research and apheresis. Um, you know, you will go to many large national meetings like ASN or even um, the big hematology meeting and apheresis may or may not be covered in much detail. And usually it's not. And so I think, you know, this is, it's a sort of a benefit and a negative that it's owned by different specialties. Um, just some terminology, uh, I want to kind of give you uh, a, a lay down of what's accepted terminology. Um, the word apheresis came from Greek, meaning to take away, remove. You'll hear a lot of people call it plasma phoresis. The American Society for Apheresis uh, advocates that we use therapeutic plasma exchange. 
TPE as the preferred nomenclature. You know, plasmapheresis can um, refer to something done a lot in Japan or in some countries in Europe called double filtration plasmapheresis, which is a little more selective than conventional plasma exchange. So therapeutic plasma exchange is the same as PLEX or PEX, as you see in the papers, and it does not uh, tell you whether you're actually, you know, say anything about the replacement solution. You know, and I think I first started doing this, I thought, well, plasma exchange, maybe this is when you're swapping plasma for plasma. It doesn't matter if you're using albumin or plasma as a replacement. Therapeutic plasma exchange is the preferred term by the American Society for Apheresis. Non-selective technique, we're throwing out the good and the bad. Um, there are other apheresis procedures we do that are more selective or semi-selective, like double filtration plasmapheresis I mentioned is semi-selective. Uh, you lose less albumin with that, and, and you, there's a secondary pore size that's chosen to help remove the target substance from the plasma. There's immunoabsorption, where the passing plasma just binds a specific substance. Um, and lipoprotein apheresis, which is a form of immunoabsorption, uh, uh, is something that is used here in the U.S. for both uh, familial hypercholesterolemia as well as uh, FSGS cases. So when we're, you're a nephrologist, you know, we have different machines.